podcast for the Korea Art Gallery. With us today, we have John Lyon Paul, who is going to be exhibiting with us at the Korea Art Gallery from September 1st through September 22nd. Welcome to the gallery, John. Thank you, Brad. You're, you seem to be on a personal journey as well as one as an artist. Can you describe that process for us? Well, um, yeah, I, art is has become a meditation for me. And, and I guess um, what may have alerted you in the bio is that I started doing artwork simultaneously with um, the practice of meditation. Mm-hmm. So that sort of both practices, the artwork is an active practice and the and meditation is really receptive. Um, and that's, I, I started that now um, almost 40 years ago. <laughs> um, so it's it's really a lifelong practice. But yeah, it's ongoing for sure. So what came first, the meditation or the art? Uh, they were simultaneous. Uh-huh. Absolutely simultaneous. Before uh, I started to work in the visual arts, I was a writer. And uh, um on, I was in the midst of writing a play, and everything was going quite well. And in the middle of one afternoon, I looked at my hand, and it, I thought uh, it, it did not seem to belong to me. And I was totally kind of um, flummoxed. And I went outside and walked around, and I realized that the way I experienced it was a writing was taken away from me. Uh-huh. Um, and... Uh, uh, while walking around, I picked up a little piece of cedar wood. I had a pocket knife, and I carved it into a rooster. I'd never carved anything before. It was just um, a spontaneous act. And uh, months later, when I put everything together, I realized that something was taking, taken away and something was given to me at the same time. I just didn't recognize it at the moment. Um, so my first... Uh, artworks as I started meditation were um, actually carved from wood. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, long explanation, but um, that's how I experienced it. But you progressed from there to painting. Oh, yes. Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I did sculpture for several years, um, and uh, I had a very strong dream experience, which was very colorful. And uh, the next day I started painting. I, ne- I never went to art school, uh-huh. um, so I have no formal training. Um, and but my experience of this of doing artwork is really that it's a gift to me, uh-huh. and it's a gift for me to give others. And what was the first medium you, you're using in your artwork? Very first uh, was carved wood, directly carved figurative sculpture. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, humans and uh, animals and so forth. And also some metal, but they were figurative um, images, uh, which which changed after a few years. I wanted to explore um, the meaning of a vow of silence, and so I took a vow of silence uh, for seven months, during during which I um, made a sculpture called Vow of Silence. Mm-hmm. So that and the form of that was not figurative, that I needed to find a, a new and different form for that. Uh-huh. And I'm curious, in terms of the vow of silence, you had an expectation of how long you're going to take that vow and you just fulfilled that or you just felt you... No, I, my, vow, my vow was uh, for as long as it took. Uh-huh. <laughs> it, it's a, it was a very formative experience um, because... Uh, immediately after taking the vow of silence and knowing that I wanted to do a sculpture, which is af- after all a three-dimensional form, what what form would that take? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? right. Suddenly, suddenly I thought, what material should it be, and what form would it take? And um, I went through um, lots of thinking about it for, I guess, weeks. And one day I just walked up to a lonely spot on the hill in the woods and stretched out on the ground and said, okay, I give up. I'm, there's no way I can decide what form a vow of silence should take. I just have to continue being silent. And, um, and that night I had 
a very strong dream, the, the kind you have a few times in the, in the lifetime, where I, uh, I, could, I was dreaming, but I could see the room I was in. Um, and, but I also saw in the air the shape. Um, and I had a, I have the habit of reading on going to bed. There was a book by my bedstand, so I grabbed a pencil in the book and turned it to a blank back page, you know, and, and I drew what I saw in the air. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the next morning when I woke up, I thought, oh, I had this strong dream. And I looked in the book and there was a, the drawing of the sculpture I was to make. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yes. Um, it was really unusual. And, um, but uh, our, creative, uh, our creative selves uh, act in mysterious ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting story. And you, so you went from uh, sculpture to painting, and in that process, did you go through a similar type of self-awareness um, exercise? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I it, actually, uh, it was another dream, um, and I had been doing sculpture for maybe ten years, and one night I had this dream in which I had a. Uh, uh, a mason jar with a lid on it, you know, mm-hmm. and I, uh, being the uh, my own straight man, I uh, thought, I wonder what's in the mason jar. Uh-huh. So I took the top off it, and thousands of butterflies flew out of it, and the, no two were alike. They were all different colors. It was like this flood of colors coming out, and um, and the next day I started painting. Oh, nice. And so was butterflies your subject? No. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, uh, it, that's why I say it feels like a gift. Mm-hmm. Um, but we all have gifts, every, every one of us. And no matter what our gifts are, it's up to us to develop them. Mm-hmm. So that's where the practice, so to speak, the practice of art or the practice of medicine or whatever Mm -hmm. uh, practice of parenting come in you know Uh, and and i like to ask other artists the same question but when you're working on a piece how do you know when it's complete it's a great uh it's a great question it it actually um there's kind of a famous uh quote from the early abstract art days um and, you know, the difference between, say, uh, tying a paintbrush to the tail of a mule <laughs> uh-huh. and letting him swat it across the canvas and an artist stopping is there, there is a, a moment of resolution. When, when we listen to music, um, the, it, we use the word resolution and a uh, song resolves, you know, comes to a conclusion. And it's very obvious when you hear it. Well, it's the same for a painter when you're painting something. There's a moment when I like to say that the painting becomes fully itself. And one time I had a a dear friend uh, in the studio and I was showing her um, a number of paintings I had done on paper that weren't yet framed. And she wanted to get up to date with what I was doing. And um, we went through them all. And then I said, hey, I've got an idea. Why don't we go through them again? And I'll just tell you what the last mark I did on this painting was. And you imagine that away and see if, it's, see if you understand how it resolved. And we did that. And one after another, um, you know, she was just sort of amazed. She said, oh, yeah, now I see that's, that painting can, it really is complete. It's like... Um, you know, instead of being incomplete. So it's, uh, it's hard to say what it is, but it's, it's resolution. There is a resolution that happens. Mm-hmm. And to push it beyond that is, um, it's messy and unnecessary. <laughs> now, now what we're, the people are going to see are the mylar and glass studies. Yes. Uh, and this is going to be translucent, so is this going to be backlit? The paintings in the show are either on mylar, which is a very tough 
but clear uh, film, um, plastic film, mm -hmm. or on plate glass, quarter inch thick plate glass. Right. And um, the process is that I paint on the back of, let's just say, the glass or mylar. Oh, gotcha. Um, and so I actually paint almost entirely with the with the glass or mylar on a table, flat on a table. So I'm standing and moving around it, painting, so to speak, down on it. Um, and um, let's say that I make a black line with acrylic paint. Um, and then let that dry. And then I'll take a uh, another color, say red, and I'll make a, a brushy wash of red over the black line. Now, what I'm looking at would be red. I would have obscured the black line. But what the viewer will see in the finished painting is the other side. So if I were to then hold up this mylar, um, you would see a black line with red behind it. Mm -hmm. So um, these paintings are painted from the back. And... Um, which means that uh, even as I'm painting them, I'm obscuring from my view um, what may be primary on the other side. So it's um, really a very interesting activity for me. To, my visual memory is really strongly engaged. It's really exciting. And um, also it's um, in reverse. The image is reversed when you turn the glass over. Sure. Uh, so, and for instance, I sign these pieces on the bottom, and um, so from the viewer's side, my side, my signature is backwards uh -huh. uh, because it's written on the other side. Uh -huh. um, and uh, let's see, the, the paintings when they're done um, are mounted right against a, a foam core board. A white board behind them that they touch mm -hmm. and so that they are not illuminated from behind they're illuminated like any uh, watercolor or uh, canvas painting from the front uh -huh. but you're sort of speak looking from at the shiny side of the glass sure on the other side is where the painting um, has been applied the paint has been applied mm -hmm. where would you like to see your work evolve from here well um i i even though I started to do sculpture and later started to do painting, I do, I do both to this day. And before starting this series of studies, um, some of which will be in this show, uh, there are now uh, over 50 of these studies that I've done in the last uh, two and a half to three years. Uh, just before starting these studies, these paintings, I worked on a sculpture for um, almost every day for two years. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked back and forth in two and three dimensions and um, also from the world of color and line you know, paintings to the, um, the kind of solid materials uh, I use in sculpture. Um, and they... Uh, they kind of feed one another, but I usually don't work both painting and sculpting simultaneously. I usually finish a piece and then... So, uh, so when you ask where I'm going from here, I have lots of projects, uh, sculptural projects. I also have a, another uh, group of paintings I'm working on um, that is sort of hold, on hold while I'm working on these studies. Um, and that, that is a series of paintings called Shrouds for Children. And they are, uh, there are only a, two of them at the moment. Um, but they're paintings in the form of a shroud, that is to say a cloth. They're not painted on cloth, but they're as if they were cloth. Um, a cloth that one wraps around the body of one who's died. Mm -hmm. And it sounds maudlin or um, what, negative, but um, uh, the, each one of these paintings is about a particular child whose 
death was caused by some human intervention, some large um, event. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the two children who I've done shrouds for right so far are uh, a boy who was Austrian and who was killed in Auschwitz uh, in the early 1940s, um, named Georges, and a girl who was uh, in Biafra and starved in the late 60s uh, due to um, an embargo of the government of the, her tribe. Um, and both of these paintings are extremely colorful, though they're completely different palettes from one another, as befits these two children who were very different from one another. So anyway, that, uh, that's kind of a poor explanation because it's a very complicated and um, uh, long-term project. I imagine that at some point there will be a couple of dozen of those paintings mm-hmm. and that uh, uh, they'll be displayed together, um, each one with an accompanying photograph of the child. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though it sounds, it can sound, um, well, it's certainly a, about, there's a, a great sadness, but I found in painting each one of these that I felt like I was releasing um, this child's potential and beauty back into the world and giving back to the world something that the child would have had he or she lived. Mm. So that's a, a long project um i have really don't know how many paintings there'll be um but yeah that's one that's one of the many avenues i'm i'm exploring as well as some big sculptures i have planned yeah it's fascinating i'm sure uh, the people who visit the cray are going to see something special in your work and uh we're looking forward to having you at the cray and again you're going to be at the reception on saturday Yes, uh, yeah. From six to eight PM, so people have the opportunity to meet you and talk to you live. So, I'm I'm very much uh, enjoying my reception by folks at the Quarry up to this point, and 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 I visited Warren for the first time earlier this year, and I'm planning to uh, do some hiking around the area too. <laughs> oh, so. great! Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the opening and to to meeting folks. Well, well, thanks for taking the time to speak with me and. Uh, And uh, we look forward to the show. Thanks so much. Of the studies in the show, there are some that are painted on mylar and some are painted on plate glass. And the ones, uh, the first ones I did were on mylar. I did about uh, um, 30 or so paintings on mylar. They're all. 24 inches by 24 inches. All the paintings in the show are square. Um, And uh, these were, it was totally experimental for me. I started by applying acrylic inks to them and to, uh, you know, mylar and glass are not absorbent Mm -hmm. like um, canvas or paper or wood or other surfaces one paints on. So one of the characteristics is how the paint flows and dries and uh, clogs or whatever. There are different characteristics because it doesn't absorb. Um, and so the the thickness of the paint is one of the things that I think people will enjoy about these paintings. They have, they are at place in places very opaque and dense, and in other places very lightly painted. Um, so there's a, a sense as you stand in front of one of them of different depths. I'm not. Speaking here of perspective, though, a number of the paintings are um, are uh, based on landscape or the elements, mm-hmm. um, and, they, and there is a sense of perspective. But I'm speaking in terms of the uh, quality of reflection of light. Anyway, um, in in pick one, um, the earliest painting in the show 
is uh, number two, is Mylar study number two. Um, and it has a very light treatment, with very free brush, brush work. Um, and I think it, uh, people find it very refreshing. It's, uh, um, and yet it has a complexity. Um, it, it, one has the feeling of uh, space and earth. It, I, this does relate to the elements. Mm-hmm. Particular, uh, there's less fire in this, but there's certainly water, earth, and air in this piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as one looks at it, you, it's almost like you're, you could be looking um, through a cleft in rocks with sky above, or you could be looking down at a river. <laughs> so there's sort of a, um, a mixture of perspective, so to speak. Sure. Um, and as I say, that was actually the second piece I did. Um, uh, if we move to, let's see, let's let's move to Mylar Study Six, um, which has um, some diamond shapes in it, and um, I think it's worth noting that a lot of my painting mixes. I mix what you might call natural shapes, squiggly lines. Um, and so forth, with ge- geometrical shapes, with straight lines or uh, sh- you know, geometrical shapes. In this case, you'll see diamond shapes in the painting. And I find that you know both are, are natural. We have crystals that are perfect squares and so forth in, in nature. But the, it's very dynamic to see both of these kinds of shapes what I call natural squiggly shapes next to um, geometric shapes. And this painting also has um, some bits of map um, collaged. And there's a a, a blue uh, kind of arch in the painting, which if one zeroes in on, you can see is actually a painted bit of map. Um, Oh, yeah. So uh, a few of them have some collage elements. A lot of my paintings outside of this series involves painting over collage. So mm-hmm. kind of something to notice there. If you, if you go to a study, Mylar Study 14, um, you'll see there's a lot of sort of squares. This is a piece which is meant to be pretty much uh, based on a fanciful landscape and the Squares are kind of the sky area. Mm-hmm. Um, again, uh, they're very rich and they're like gems when you get close. It's very intimate. The, there's also a kind of lavender kind of square shape mid-left in the painting, which feels like a window. It's almost like suddenly you can look through the painting. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the kind of... Um, translucent area and this more opaque areas that sort of hold you back visually. Um, study 15 has, uh, um, it, if you think of the elements, you'll see sort of a blue water element. And um, I think of the top that where there are lots of squares as a sky element. The lower part has a dark area, which feels like it's inside the earth. Uh Um, moving to number 20 um, this is a um, a piece that I privately call even though it's called Mylar Study 20 I call it Eagle Fire Dance and it it, um, if you kind of look at it you can see an eagle in it and you can see uh, perhaps a human with an eagle Hood dancing, but it's very fiery. Mm-hmm. This piece has uh, uh, more fire than anything. So mm-hmm. these, a lot of these paintings, um, I'm experimenting not only with the sense of landscape, but but really the elements. 
Mylar Study 21 is based on the landscape, and my uh, personal name for it is Wheeling Sky. <laughs> Uh-huh. So that may that may give that may get in the way of how people see it, or it may open it up. Um, the next painting I did was is number twenty two, and that is um, a piece that is uh, featured on the postcard for this show, and and signs that I've seen McCrary uh, generate. And this piece is a landscape, and it's uh, deliberately meant to be. Um, a mountain scape uh, right after uh, a rainstorm. Mm-hmm. And the top of it has uh, very strong brush strokes that um, dan- kind of dancing across the top of it or lifting off of the earth. And if you've ever been in a car wash, there's a one part of the car wash thing where these big Canvas the brushes. things, mm-hmm. yeah. The, well, not the brushes, but the canvas things that sort of s- swipe across um, the car, right? Um, and that's how the sky feels in this one to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I think you'll see in studies twenty three and twenty six and twenty seven that they're all that those three are all based on landscape, particularly 26, which um, is has a, a lake in the foreground and a sky. Uh, a, lo- a lot of people find that a very strong image. Um, and, of course, this, there's a lot of orange in it, so it, in a way it's very fiery, too. Mm-hmm. In starting to paint on glass, I uh, also changed how I was painting a little bit that I think it's hard to describe but one of the things that you'll see in the show is that all the paintings on glass have a border that is uh, gray not all the images that you'll see with this interview will show that border but um, it represents what a matted surface would be in a regular painting around the painting between it and the frame mm. but here you'll see if you look at that gray area and some of these paintings you can see it um you'll see ink lines and smudges and splatters of ink and uh, spatters of paint and that's those are actually the first marks that i made on the glass so that uh, at the end when I painted the gray area around to sort of set off the, let's say, that to, uh, like a setting of a gem, uh, set off the painting, um, caught in the matted area, the gray area, are some of the earliest gestures. So there's sort of a, a little bit of kind of uh, painting archaeology there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but it... it um, it's something that I, as the more I painted on glass, the more I've worked in, outside the margin of the original square into the, in that gray area. And you'll see, for instance, if you go to study 19, which uh, um, shows clearly at the top some diamond shapes that are really in the gray area, mm-hmm. in that um, area, and also at the bottom of this square of the painting, you'll see that it bulges, so to speak, into the gray area. So this is a painting that's not confined. Um, And uh, in fact, I think I supplied a detail of that. So you can zoom in and see the upper left quarter or so of the painting. And you'll see there's actually some collaged map behind the glass, too. Mm-hmm. So you'll see some lines that are there that are actually uh, maybe even numbers and words. If you, you can see them when you get close to the painting, right? That also uh, enliven it. So there's a lot of techniques I'm using in these glass paintings. Um, but the, going into the, looking at the borders of them is kind of an exciting thing because the question is, what? Where does the painting stop? Comes to mind, right? I think it's. 
like a Zen koan. There's no answer to it, but uh, uh, maybe many answers to it. Um, and then in the the later glass studies, uh, say studies twenty, twenty four, and twenty five, you'll um, they start to look more like um, maybe windows, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some grids that uh, perhaps are like mullions or frames around windows. They're not meant to be stained glass, but uh, they refer to that. Um, and number 24 and 25 are actually larger than all the other paintings in the show, and they'll probably have to be on easels. Um, but they'll be accessible to see. They're, uh, they're 40. 40 inches square. So uh-huh. painting in a square is a, is a pretty interesting thing. It, there are not many paintings or photographs or computer screens or stages or books that, or, you know, vi- or video or computer screens that are square. They're rectangles. And um, the square has been thought by some to kill an image and part of what I was doing in these studies is to explore that um, and I think that um, I'm not the first to explore that of course but uh, it was part of what I was um, it was a way I was sort of restricting or constricting my approach that actually freed me up 